Good evening. I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. We are so pleased with the turnout for our virtual forums and appreciate the opportunity to feel connected, even though we can't be together at the library. I would also like to acknowledge our generous sponsors, the support of the underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum series, lead sponsor Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. In 1958, in remarks at the annual Gridiron Dinner with members of the media, then Senator John F. Kennedy joked, I have received the following wire from my generous daddy. Dear Jack, don't buy a single vote more than necessary. I'll be damned if I'm going to pay for a landslide. Kennedy went on to be elected president in one of the closest elections of US history. In the popular vote, his margin over Nixon was just over 100,000 out of a total of nearly 69 million votes cast. But his success in many urban and industrial states gave him a clear majority of 303 to 219 in the electoral vote. This fall, we will mark both the 60th anniversary of President Kennedy's election, and we will vote ourselves in the 2020 election, during which, once again, the distinction between the popular vote and the electoral vote will be put to the test. We are so grateful to have this timely opportunity to explore the history of and contemporary challenges to the Electoral College with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Mary Sarah Builder is the Founders Professor of Law at the Boston College Law School. Her most recent book, Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention, was awarded the 2016 Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy. The author of numerous books and, and, and articles and a frequent speaker and commentator, she also clerked for the Honorable Francis Murnahan Jr. U.S. Court of Appeals Fourth Circuit and served as a legal his history consultant to Steven Spielberg's on Amistad. Ned Foley holds the Ebersold Chair in Constitutional Law at The Ohio State University, where he also directs its election law program. He clerked for Chief Justice Patricia Wald of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Uh, DC Circuit and Justice Harry Blackman of the U.S. Supreme Court, and also served as state solicitor in the office of Ohio Attorney General, Ohio's Attorney General. His most recent book is Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, The Rise, Demise, and Potential Restoration of the Jeffersonian Electoral College. Jesse Wegman is a member of the New York Times editorial board where he has written about the Supreme Court and legal affairs since 2013. He previously worked as a reporter, editor, and producer at outlets including National Public Radio, the New York Observer, the New York Observer, Reuters, The Daily Beast, and Newsweek. He is the author of a new book, Let the People Pick the President, The Case for Abolishing the Electoral College. I'm also so pleased to introduce Jonathan Kaufman, our moderator for this evening's discussion. A Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, editor, and author, he joined Northeastern University in 2015 <laughs> as professor and director of the School of Journalism. Prior to joining Northeastern, he held senior positions at Bloomberg News, the Wall Street Journal, and the Boston Globe. His most recent book is, forth is the forthcoming The Last Kings of Shanghai, the rival Jewish dynasties that helped create modern China. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I'd like to start things off um, with, a, with a brief history lesson, um, trying to understand how we ended up with this thing called the Electoral College um, and uh, whether it changed over the years to, to what we're struggling with today. Um, I'm wondering if, Jesse, you can kind of start us off on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, one of the, I think, most common misconceptions about the Electoral College and its adoption uh, in, in Philadelphia in 1787 is that it was this carefully designed, uh, intricate component of our constitutional system. And when you actually go back and look through the debates at the convention, uh, that's not what was happening at all. In fact, uh, the, the adoption of the college was one of the very last things that the delegates did in Philadelphia. They uh, argued over it for literally the entire time from uh, 
late May until early September. Uh, they had, I think, 21 different days of debate on it. They held 31 or 32 different votes, depending on how you count. Uh, and really, the, the, the system that uh, was was adopted uh, in, in, in September by the delegates and sent out to the states for ratification was cobbled together in the final days of the convention in a side room uh, of Independence Hall, what we now call Independence Hall, uh, uh, by a few delegates who were basically trying to get a system that everyone could agree to just to get the Constitution out the door. And so I think it's really important that we remember um, that the system that was that was chosen was not part of some elaborate, carefully designed, well thought out scheme. It was really just to get the Constitution finished. They knew that whatever system they adopted, George Washington was going to be the first president. And so the stakes weren't really that high. So I think that's that's the overview uh, uh, of, of, why, of, of how we got the Electoral College. The reasons that we chose the system that we did are very contingent. They're very dependent on that time period. Uh, and, and I'll just briefly say one of them is logistics. I think that's what m many of us learned is that we have an Electoral College uh, or we had the founders chosen Electoral College because they knew that most people wouldn't know enough about national political candidates in order to make an informed decision. So they wanted people who were more informed uh, to help make that decision. Uh, another element uh, that was influencing their decision was obviously the, the fact of slavery and the, the dispute between the North and the South over that in institution. Um, and this is where I think I, I would love to hear from uh, uh, Mary uh, Sarah Builder because uh, you know James Madison, who is widely regarded as the father of the Constitution, whose notes give us the fullest uh, expression of what happened at that summer in 1787, uh, he himself uh, uh, came out openly in favor of a popular vote for president. Uh, he said it would be the fittest way to pick a leader. And then he said, uh, essentially, the South will never go for it. And then I quote him here, quoting himself, on the score of the Negroes. Uh, and what he meant there was, uh, you know, states with uh, 40, 50 percent of their population enslaved and obviously without the right to vote would find themselves uh, very much uh, disadvantaged in uh, uh, the power to choose a president uh, if it were a popular vote. So you have all of these factors that existed then that don't exist today. And I think it's important to remember both the contingency of the, the process that led to the, the adoption of the college, but also the other factors that, that, uh, that the founders were considering at the time that just don't exist today. So Ned, let me ask you, I mean, was there, as Jesse says, this was not sort of handed down um, as sort of the perfect system. Were there debates um, at the convention, but also afterwards in terms of this is an imperfect system or is this a more recent debate? Have, have other generations kind of questioned why we have this system, even right after the founding? Oh, absolutely. And I think the most important thing we can think about about our electoral college is it's not the one that was created at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Um, that's what I thought for decades, even as a law professor, because you think the Constitution, you think the electoral college, you think Madison, Hamilton, and the in the origins. But in fact, our electoral college was created by the 12th Amendment. Congress wrote it in 1803, sent it to the states for ratification in 1804 in time for Jefferson's re-election that year. That's the governing electoral college. As a law student, I was told it was sort of a minor tweak on the original design. But what I discovered when I wrote my book, um, that's not true. That was kind of a misconception that we've been this the received wisdom. It turns out that there was a full philosophical debate in 1803 in Congress. The length of that debate was much longer than the what happened in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention. And it was based on a on experience of four elections, the two for George Washington, but then two different ones involving partisan competition. And so when they rewrote the Electoral College in 1803, they were living in a new world uh, and had seen the failure of the original design. So it's kind of a mixed conception if we try to go back and figure out what the meaning of our own Electoral College is by trying to go back to 1787 in Philadelphia. Instead, we need to go back to 1803 and think, you know, why did they redesign it? What, what were they doing? And as Jesse said, the first version the Philadelphia version was built for George Washington, um, not just him personally, but 
the ideal of a consensus president who would be above political parties, above factions. Uh, they thought they could have a constitutional system that would keep political parties in check. And they, the particular rules for the Electoral College was to be consensus oriented. Again, a, a complete failure that emerged first in 1796 and then a disaster election of 1800 that we could talk about. Um, Jefferson made- Briefly, why was 1800 a disaster? Well, it was because there was a tie between Jefferson and his own running mate, Aaron Burr, because the original system gave each elector two votes, uh, not realizing that in a world of two-party competition, each elector allied to a party would have, you know, they'd have a presidential candidate, Jefferson, a vice presidential candidate, Burr, and that those would be the two votes. And so the idea uh, of that system was just not what the original founders fathomed. Now, if Burr had been an honorable guy, he would have stepped aside and let Jefferson be president because that's what everybody understood. But we all know that Burr was in it for himself. So he thought, maybe I can cut a deal with the other party, the Federalists. And that almost led to um, you know, a kind of mini civil war early on in our history. I mean, the militias in Virginia and Pennsylvania were moving in case the Federalists were gonna steal the presidency from Jefferson. You know, they got through that and there's some other fascinating details, but the upshot is, is when Jefferson was president, he then was, became popular and, he, and in the 1802 midterms, his party did really well. Part of that was the Louisiana Purchase. And so in 1803, they think, how can we redesign the system? Now, the image of the winner is now Jefferson, not Washington. And the authentic winner is for a world of two-party competition. And the Jeffersonians who now have enough votes in the Senate and the House of Representatives to push an amendment through, something very hard to do, as we know right now, as we try to amend the college, Electoral College, or to do a constitutional amendment, but they had just barely enough votes. And so they redesigned it around the principle of majority rule, but a complicated principle of majority rule for a federal system where you're supposed to win majorities at the state level to accumulate a national majority in the Electoral College. That's the Jeffersonian vision. He actually won re-election according to that vision in 1804, but for the reasons we could get into, starting with Andrew Jackson, we kind of abandoned the vision of majority rule and can produce minority winners. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, President Trump won without a majority of the votes at the state levels that give him an electoral college win. Right. I mean, what is interesting, though, is there is a precedent for the country saying this isn't working and we're going to try something else. It's not as if we're trying to kind of upend a whole system. This has been tinkered with and, and readjusted um, in the in the past. Um, Mary, maybe pull us back a little bit. And if you could put this in context. They kick it to a committee serving. And that committee's interim parts because they dealt with all the things that are notes from James Madison for that period, the notes that he took, say, we have we don't know how to do it. Here's our new idea. We'll have this super complicated process whereby there will be electors. And these electors will actually pick the president. And so it will be kind of independent, but it'll be kind of not like the people. And then you can tell it's one of those things where like the committee got all nerdy because they're they're like, you know, and what if the person doesn't have majority votes? Then we have this and that. And and actually the electoral college is an incredibly long and, you know, in some ways kind of boring section of the constitution that goes into way more detail than most of the rest of the constitution. And so everybody looks at it and we know this from the journal, people literally looked at it. They said, well, we need to think about it overnight. And then they were like, uh, we'll make one small change. I mean, literally they're like, whatever, we don't know, we'll get it done. And um, and so that's the system we um, end up with. And, and Madison, two years later, uh, when he recorded his notes, um, he said that Governor Morris came back and um, independent of Congress. So, so we can basically keep the president in check so we can impeach the president. And on the other hand, we can't imagine the people electing the president. And and we sometimes, I think, misunderstand that nobody knows who the people is. The states allow different people to go as government ballot. Most people vote by voice and they vote by voice 
in front of people. And so they were also worried that um, you'd have sort of a lot of intimidation of voters. And they and so they basically punt on the whole issue. And we end up with this uh, incredibly um, elaborate um, process. The system that they devised gave um, inordinate weight to Southern states that um, had legalized slavery. And that was particularly true of the state of Virginia. So the, between 400 and 500,000. But Virginia had an additional nearly 300,000 people held in slavery. Virginia held um, almost half the enslaved will end up with more political power in electing the president. Right. This is we talk all the time about red and blue states, which drives me insane. Uh, that is entirely an artifact of another element of the Electoral College, which is the winner take all rule. And that is a rule that 48 out of 50 states use to award their electors to the candidates. So once those electors are chosen, the decision is, well, how do we give them to the candidates? In 48 of 50 states, whichever candidate wins the most votes implies that a state is either like a 100% Democratic or 100% Republican, which we know is absurd. States are all, what is the Electoral College and did it ever do good? I think we have to remember that that it is, the, it is um, it's an artifact of state laws. And if it has ever helped the country or has ever, uh, has ever led to an outcome that would have been worse had we had a popular vote. Uh, and and I, I guess I'm, I'd be interested in what uh, uh, the a popular vote. As Mary said, who the people were was obviously very different then than it is today. But still, the idea that the people would vote directly for their president was there at the beginning. It's been there all along and it's there today. There have actually been more than 700 attempts. You asked about, you know, was this, uh, was this ever challenged? 700 attempts to amend or abolish the college since the founding. Okay, so um, let's let's get to the fun part, which is the three of you are members of the of the Blue Ribbon Commission that's charged to come up with a reform of the um, of the Electoral College. We're going to go into that side room in Independence Hall and kind of hammer this out. Um, what would you come up with, and how would you sell it to a country that's deeply polarized, that's dealing with you know on the one hand low levels of information but high levels of opinion? Kind of if you can address both the mechanics of it, but also the politics of it. Um, Mary, you want to kick us off on that? Well, um, let's see, the other, the other two people both wrote books, and, um, and I'm just a historian. So, um, but here's the thing that I guess I think is very interesting about um, the Electoral College, is the Electoral College doesn't work today the way it was even imagined to work. And the reason that is, is because in the beginning of the 20th century, we capped the number of representatives. So one thing that um, everybody in the 1780s really cared about was that the person you were electing was somebody who wasn't super far removed from you. And in fact, the one change that George Washington made to the um, Constitution was they had the original representation set at one representative for every 40,000 people. And literally on the last day, George Washington said, I wanna change that. And they dropped that to one to 30,000. So for a very long time, the Electoral College in its very first version, where it was sort of like the top voter was president, the next voter got to be vice president or the post 12th amendment version where the parties ran on both things. Um, had some representation to the number of people in this country. And one of the important things to realize is that the Electoral College doesn't calculate representation based on citizenship. It doesn't calculate it based on voters. It calculates on the entire population. And I actually think that's very important because it emphasizes how everybody who lives in this country deserves to be represented. So in the early 20th century, because we use that same calculation for Congress, Congress reset, basically put an upper limit on the number of people who could serve in Congress. And what that's meant is that the Electoral College has mimicked that limit. But that's not constitutional. The text of the Constitution just says that you get the number of electors to which you shall be entitled. It doesn't say entitled under current congressional law. And I think there's a decent argument that it's entitled under the terms of the Constitution. That would mean with the number of people in the United States, if I did the math right, we'd have 11,000 electors. 
You can imagine all sorts of interesting ways that you could divide those 11,000 electors up to the county level. There's a lot of people who think that um, if we brought politics down to the county level in terms of the presidential politics, that that would at least be some stopgap to pulling us towards a more popular vote. And that could be done simply by Congress agreeing that this interpretation that the Electoral College has to be capped, just like Congress, no longer applies. At that point, it seems to me with 11,000 electors, the United States public would either be like, wow, this is a great system because it mimics the popular vote, or that's the craziest system ever. You've got 11,000 random people voting for the president, and you would then have the political motivation uh, to get rid of it. So my idea is to let the Electoral College return to its original level, uh, 11,000 electors. And it would be, and it would be, sorry to interrupt, it would be true in a popular vote, you know, this is something that, this is an argument that I've found has appealed to some conservatives, which is that I don't think they realize or nobody realizes that the electoral college now counts the power of undocumented uh, people, people who are here and are counted in our census and therefore ex represented in the, in the House of Representatives, but who have no vote. They actually have an influence and, and states, uh, it's actually about, I believe 14 to 16 electoral votes are dependent on those people, and they and and that's largely in, in blue states, with the exception of Texas, uh, that that get extra votes in the electoral college because of undocumented immigrants. Uh, in a popular vote, those those people would not would not have an opportunity to have their voice heard well, at all. Well, talk about that, Jesse. My sense is you're prepared to just cut through all this, throw out the baby, the bathwater, the whole thing, and just go to a popular vote. Look, I mean, the subtitle of my book is the case for abolishing the college. You know, abolish ab abolition is a is a powerful word, especially on book jackets. Um, but when you when you go when you go into the details of it, and and in my book in chapter seven, I do, uh, you find that the, that the reform effort that is the most the fully advanced at this stage is is something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, and that is um, it's a it's a it's a mouthful, but really it's what it is is a, it's a it's a means of getting to a popular vote through the vehicle of the Electoral College as it is designed and as it functions in the Constitution today. It is not an end run around the Constitution, which a lot of people call it. It is literally using the Electoral College as it was designed, which is as a state-based system. And I'll just very briefly describe what it is because it is a reform that I think is plausible and we're closer to reaching it than we are to a, to a constitutional amendment today. It's a, an interstate compact is just an agreement among states to do something. Uh, you know, it might be about um, negotiating water rights for a body of water that they share or about setting up an interstate lottery system or something like that. This, the National Vote Interstate Compact, is an agreement among states that join it to award all of their electors, not to the winner of their state vote. Remember, I said 48 states now give the, the, all of their electors to the winner of their state vote, but to give it to the winner of the national popular vote. And when states representing a majority of electors in the country, that's 270, that's the, that's the magic number, that's the number you need to become president. When states representing 270 electors join this compact, you put the logic together and you realize that the person who wins the most votes in the country becomes the president every time. And that in turn forces both parties to campaign and govern as though they are actually responsive to the entire country and not to a few slivers uh, of the electorate in these so-called battleground states, which is exactly what happens today, that voters in Michigan or Ohio or Pennsylvania or Florida or Arizona matter almost exclusively to both parties at, to, you know, and to the exclusion of all of the rest of Americans living everywhere else. More than 80% of Americans don't live in battleground states. So I really think to me that reform any reform that gets us to a direct popular vote and any any reform that gets us to the candidates who have to run the country actually having to appeal to the interests of the whole country is a good one. So you want to keep the framework of the Electoral College because it's going to be hard to do it, but, but, but inject more of a national popular vote responsiveness into it. I, I'm actually, I'm agnostic on this. I, I would be fine with a, a, a constitutional amendment too. And part of the story of my book is we've actually come extremely close to a constitutional amendment. In 1969, 1970, the House of Representatives actually passed an amendment abolishing the Electoral College and replacing it with a popular vote. This was a four-year effort 
More than 80% of Americans uh, supported it at the time. Republicans, Democrats, Richard Nixon supported it. George H.W. Bush supported it. Bob Dole, you know, top Republicans, top Democrats. And it was blocked in the Senate by three Southern segregationists, right? So once again, race uh, comes up in this story. It's always there, right? Race is, race is just threaded through and, and, and racism and, and particularly racial subjugation is threaded through this entire story. The three Southern segregationists knew which side their bread was buttered on. They knew that in the electoral college, white voters in their states, in, in places like Mississippi, in places like South Carolina, were enough of a majority that they would always steer all of their electoral votes to, the, to their candidate, the black voters were essentially ignored. And if that was a popular vote, all of those black voters, millions of black voters in the South would suddenly start to count. And that's what I wanna see happen. I wanna see everybody count in this country rather than a few people in a few you know, strategically located states. Okay, so um, Ned, you're in Ohio, swing state, and I sense that your view is somewhat in the middle, trying to kind of find a way to, to move us forward without, uh, uh, offending each side too much. Well, if we could do a constitutional amendment, I'd be all in favor of a national popular vote, as long as it depended on a majority winner again. Uh, most countries that use national popular votes to elect their presidents, like France, for example, make sure they have some kind of runoff mechanism to have a genuine majority winner. The problem with the compact idea that Jesse articulated is because it's built into the electoral college system, it's dependent on only achieving a, a national popular plurality win. So in a fragmented election, you wouldn't get to, ma to a majority vote. And if people remember, I think we're gonna avoid this problem this year because um, Justin Amash declined to be the Libertarian Party candidate recently, and then the Starbucks CEO, Howard Schultz, stepped down. But when Howard Schultz was thinking about running as an independent, people were freaking out because they thought that he might uh, siphon votes away so that the anti-Trump vote, this is not really a partisan point because in different years it could affect different parties, but just by way of illustration, um, the fear was that a three-way race between Trump, the Democrat, and Howard Schultz would cause Trump to sneak through with the plurality because the anti-Trump vote would be split between the Democrat and the Starbucks CEO who had a billion dollars just to fund on his own campaign. If you're concerned about that with their system that we have, you need to be equally concerned about that with the National Popular Vote Compact because the compact replicates that same problem of a three-way split. The reason why our current system can't handle more than two candidates is because when the 12th Amendment redesigned the system, again, they were moving from a world of where they hoped there would be no political parties, just factions that never would coalesce to parties, and you get this consensus, George Washington, above the fray. That didn't work. So then they had two-party competition between the Federalists and the Jeffersonians. They designed a system for that. They didn't anticipate the advent of third parties or, or independent candidates, and our system cannot handle them. So yes, a constitutional amendment to deal with all of that would be great. If we can't get an amendment, the thing that we most need is at the state level to change the way we do winner take all. Jesse's absolutely right that states have chosen winner take all except for a couple of states. The Jeffersonians knew that would happen. In fact, Madison and Jefferson together in 1800 moved Virginia to winner take all to take advantage of the clout that you can do by putting all your electoral votes behind one candidate who's the majority preferred within the state. So they knew winner take all, but they thought it would be majority based. The way to achieve majority based winner take all now would be using something called ranked choice voting because ranked choice ballots give you majority winners instead of plurality winners. I absolutely agree with Ned. Uh, I think voting is a wonderful uh, invention. It's been adopted all over the country. Um, New York City, my uh, city is gonna use it for the first time next year. Um, I, I think it's a great uh, in innovation uh, and, and does solve that problem. But let me just say this, and, and pulling back the lens, you know, no system, no electoral system is perfect. Um, the, each one of them has flaws, each one of them has weaknesses. I think 
to me, what we really need to focus on right now is the bigger problem, which is that the people, uh, that the vast majority of Americans are essentially ignored in every presidential election. Their voices are effectively erased by the winner, the statewide winner take all rules. Yes, I guess there is a risk that when you have many parties, you might have a, low, a, a, per, a person who wins with a plurality of the vote. But even when we had that in 1992, Bill Clinton still won with 43% of the vote. The fact that we're able to function as a republic with a president who lost the popular vote by 3 million votes makes me a little less concerned that people are going to riot and revolt when a president wins with, say, 40, 43, 45%. And I just, I really, I really want to emphasize that point, which is that the, that the, that the fundamental idea is that America is a democratizing society. It has been from the beginning. It started with the removal of property qualifications for white voters. Then it included after the Civil War, black voters, women in 1919 and uh, in 1920. And, and, and all the way through, every decision that has been made virtually has been in, in, in toward a, a broader, more egalitarian, um, more inclusive democracy. I think the Electoral College is this last vestige of the the original um, uh, constitution and the and the and the twelfth amendment, obviously that that li that still lives today, and that keeps us from having that broader democracy. Okay, well, let me. I mean, this actually leads into uh, one of the audience questions um, that was sent in that I'm um, reading uh, off a text here, which is sort of be careful what you wish for. Is it possible that if we went to a national popular vote, if we um, if we were able to do that or go to some version of that within the confines of the Electoral College, it would actually increase the amount of money that's spent on campaigns, would make candidates more beholden to big donors because they would have to campaign in all 50 states. You know, are there unintended consequences here that we might look back um, and regret? Um, Mary, do you have any thoughts about that? Because again, one of the lessons it seems from the creation of the Electoral College was that a lot of things turned out to be true that the founders didn't really foresee, they couldn't really anticipate. And if we start changing the system, do you see that there could be other problems? I think the one thing you can say for the last 200 plus years is that politically savvy people have figured out how to work and manipulate any system that anybody right. comes up with. And so I, you know, we have the two party system we have today is a product of the 12th amendment. Um, when women voted in New Jersey in the 1790s. And women and African Americans uh, tended to vote and they tended to vote Federalist. And so one of the first things that the rising uh, Jeffersonian um, Democrats did um, pushing into New Jersey was to come up with basically laws that would disenfranchise those voters. And eventually most of the country turned to white male voting. And so I, I guess for me, it's like you have 200 plus years of um, political chicanery one way or the other. And I don't think you can run a system based on that premise. I, I would like to see a system where more Americans experienced the election mattering to them, more people in the United States. And I think that's true, particularly for young people. I happen to be somebody who thinks 16 year olds should be able to vote. And, um, and I think that a system where there were more, at least votes in the electoral college, if not uh, popular voting, would encourage people to feel more invested in the process. The winner take all approach that we have now basically um, helps, uh, you know, the TV networks on the night as they get to turn things red and blue. But most of us who live in states know that our experience of living in that state is not that that state is monolithic. And the more we could do to encourage people to have the presidential election mimic their own experience, which is they happen to live in a state, but the politics in that state are very diverse, very different across the United States, I think the better off we'd be as a country. Okay, another question, and this is something that always comes up as a journalist. Journalists love writing about this, which is faithless electors, right? We've all read the trashy novel on our vacations about the electors who have those few months to decide before they vote, and then they go in and they decide, we're not going to vote for this uh, person, we're going to vote for someone else. That actually happened this last election. Jesse, you've written about this. Could you talk about this faithless election issue, which has actually gone all the way to the Supreme Court um, very sure. recently? There's two cases before the court right now that the, that the court heard argument on a couple weeks ago and is going to decide soon. Um, the uh, the spoiler alert here is I don't think it's going to matter. Um, it's not going to matter whatever the Supreme Court decides. And that's because 
Uh, yes, faithful selectors exist. Uh, there have been uh, a few, depending on how you count them, there's been a few dozen of them o o over American history, uh, with 23,000 plus electoral votes and a few dozen faithful selectors. There's a reason for that. And that is- And faithful selectors are people who basically vote for the other person. Of the That's right, I'm sorry. So a faithful selector is someone who votes for someone other than their party's nominee. Um, uh, it, maybe this is another thing that I think Americans don't understand is there isn't some single slate of electors in every state just waiting to be told how to vote. Each candidate brings his or her own slate of electors to the process. So it, for example, in New York, if uh, more voters vote for the Democratic candidate in New York, the Democratic slate of electors gets sent to Albany to cast their ballots. So they want to vote for their candidate. Faithless electors do exist. They, they every now and then they they pop up because of you know unique uh, circumstances. I the introduction of my book tells the story of what happened in 2016, which is I think a, a, you know the exception that proves the rule. There were 10 faithless electors or 10 people who attempted to be faithless electors. Um, they didn't they didn't come close to altering the outcome. No faithless elector has ever come close to altering the outcome. And and I just think even if the Supreme Court were to decide that electors could vote however they wanted in line with this idea of what the founders actually intended, uh, I don't think it would make a difference because electors want to vote for the candidate that they've been tapped to vote for. They don't want to vote for somebody else. Um, that, that's, the, that's the quick answer. Uh, there's, there's longer answers that involve the fact that the founders didn't even, I don't even think the founders themselves actually had this idea of, of independent electors, but that's a longer story. Um, Ned, you know, and this may be a broader question as well. There's so much concern now about hacking the election, tampering with the election, all sorts of things that can happen um, at the state level um, and elsewhere. Um, what's your sense of, um, is the Electoral College vulnerable to that kind of, of, of hacking or tampering or the threats to the election? The Electoral College is very vulnerable to disputes in, in a close election. It, the disputes st could start at the state level, but then metastasize and reach Congress. And I agree with Jesse that it's unlikely that a faceless elector could make a difference. But the one scenario where there's at least a, a small chance that it might is if you had a very narrow 270 to 268 result in the Electoral College, then that's where one elect elector bribed or going rogue, you know, could really upset the-, the But system. we had that in 2000 and it didn't happen. Which is also not inconceivable if you play with the Electoral College calculators that are on the internet. The, the partisan prediction and lineup is, a, again, partly because Nebraska and Maine allow for these single congressional districts, and a couple of those are purple enough, they could go either way. We could end up with a 269-269 split that would send the election to the House of Representatives, something that we haven't seen since 1824, but something that is built right there into the 12th Amendment. Part of the problem here is our Constitution as text was designed, as we've been talking about, a very different world in the 18th and 19th century with very different assumptions about the nature of Republican government, small r Republican government. Um, you know, I, philosophically, I'm with Jesse that we are one nation and should vote as one nation, but that's not what was intended. It was very much intended that each state would get its allotment of electors, whether they're 11,000 or 538, the most fundamental fact about the Electoral College system is it's built for a federalist system of the United States of America, not a monolithic entity. And the desire for national popular vote, as much as I share it normatively, is an attempt to put a new idea, a post-Civil War, post-FDR New Deal, of political philosophy on top of early 19th century architecture for which it wasn't built. And until we rewrite the rules, we're going to have this cognitive dissonance between the old architecture that's written into our document and the modern philosophy that we wish we had a system for. So, so let, 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 me, let me turn to Mary as our historian. What argument would you make or what argument do you think maybe some of the founders might make, which is to say, yes, the country's different now and we do need a different system. We do need to change this part of the constitution. Is there anything we can look back to um, as, as, as originalists might and, and you could point to and say, no, they would have been flexible. 
or are we in such a new world that it kind of is beyond anything they could have conceived of? Well, I, I don't think this is an originalist argument. They have a very different approach to reading the text. But I do think that um, at the end of the day, um, the people in Philadelphia were influenced by a huge number of people outside of Philadelphia. I like to call them the framing generation. And they were people who fundamentally believed that the problem with the old British system was that the people, which meant many, many different things, were not fairly represented. That was the cause of the revolution, was that deep constitutional principle. And the Constitution of 1787 didn't do a great job of fulfilling that, but it was an effort to take one step on the path. And that is why the most important aspect of the Constitution remains the part that was in large letters in every newspaper where it was printed, which is the preamble. And the largest letters of the entire preamble, if you look at contemporary constitutional Constitutional printings was we the people. And so even though they failed in all sorts of ways to get to that aspiration, that was the underlying core belief of that period in which they grew up. They were politicians. And so once they said that, they all tried to grab as much power as they could for themselves. But they would have thought that the system ought to represent the people more. And I think that's true today. I actually think they would be mystified as to why there's only 530 some votes. And it might mess up Nate Silver's and everybody's website, but I do think 11,000 electoral votes would at least put us in a path towards realizing that we are a very, very, very different country than the one that the yeah, framers set up. Let me just on a political analysis. I mean, do you see any way that a country that is so polarized right now could come around to the question of let the people vote, make it a national popular vote, seem simple, or is that yeah. just a non-starter? I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a matter of coming around. I think everybody agrees with it in their heart. I think the debate is a partisan one right now because twice in the last 20 years it's split, the election has split, and the Republican has won both times. I guarantee you, if it went the other way, we would have be done with the Electoral College by a constitutional amendment tomorrow morning. Uh, and and you, know, you know that because Donald Trump tweeted, uh, the Electoral College is a disaster for democracy. Back in 2012, he did that because he thought Mitt Romney was gonna win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College. Everybody feels this in their heart. And I, and, and I think that is, that's what we have to tap into is that gut sense of, political equality, that all our votes count the same, one person, one vote, and majority rule that Ned is talking about, those are principles at the core of our democracy and people want them vindicated in their choice for a leader. And I just, just to illustrate a little further, I think Mary uh, had it exactly right and she quotes the, the preamble to the constitution, we the people. I just wanna draw attention to the next few words. Uh, we the people of the United States. What many people don't know is those words were actually not in the original draft of the Constitution. The original draft said, we the people of New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and so, so on and so forth. And late in the process, Governor Morris, um, a Pennsylvania delegate, changed it to we the people of the United States. And I think that's a really important change because it emphasizes that what was being created here was a union a union of states, right? It took 60, 70 years uh, and, and a bloody civil war to, to vindicate that ideal, uh, but it was a union. It was not just a collection of random states uh, sort of in treaty with one another. It was a, one supreme national government. And when you're electing the leader of that government, as opposed to governors of states, representatives of states, lawmakers of states, which are state-based elections, when you're electing the leader of the country, you need to elect that leader as a country and not as a, an, a, a, an agglomeration of states. Yes, okay. Yes, and I, and I just want to give you the last word, but I, I want to ask you, you know, because you covered sort of, you know, wrote about the, the 12th Amendment and Jefferson in that crisis of 1800. Do you see a similar crisis coming um, that if we continue to have these split votes of the popular vote and the electoral college, we could reach a point where the country is ready? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, unfortunately, it does take crises to get change. Um, you know, people, Jesse's right, people have wanted to get rid of the electoral college for decades. The Gallup polling organization has polled this for 70 years, and majorities, vast majorities of Americans have wanted to get rid of the electoral college. It's just so difficult to amend the Constitution. So that seems, if we're going to kind of get the constitutional amendment to, to effectuate this change, unfortunately, it's going to be a crisis that provokes it, I think. 
Okay. Um, well, I want to thank you all. It was really a fascinating uh, conversation. I think we learned a lot about history, um, a lot about what works and what doesn't. And um, I guess the final word to everyone is, is that even though it can be frustrating, everyone's vote does count. So everybody should go out there and vote. Um, and that maybe there will be some greater effort down the road to try to make the system more responsive. Um, but thank you all. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for putting up with our uh, brief technical glitches. Um, and, uh, and thank you for joining us uh, this evening.